Uh, welcome to this GTAP seminar series. Um, my name is Angel Aguiar, and I will be the moderator of this, uh, I think it's the fourth uh, virtual seminar series. And the topic of this seminar is environmental extensions of GTAP, uh, land use and GTAP power. We're going to be featuring a couple of papers from the Journal of Global Economic Analysis, uh, volume five, uh, number two of 2020. This, uh, as you know, this is a uh, seminar is being recorded and will be available to all the participants and the general uh, public uh, afterwards. Um, about a little bit, let me start with talking a little bit about the journal. Uh, the journal publishes foundational work in global economic analysis, including methods and theory, data and parameter estimation, and pedagogy. Uh, Tom mentioned this last uh, time we had this uh, seminar, and I thought it was good to re-emphasize. Uh, according to the Simple Citation Index for the Journal of Global Economic Analysis, uh, it is now in the top 3% of all economic journals, as reported by REPEC. The journal is fully open access with no submissions or publication fees. It is supported by the GTAP Consortium. Submitted papers are subject to double blind peer review process. And the quantitative papers are replicated prior to publishing. So the reader will have access to supplementary material and can, and with the zip file, they can have all the materials they needed to, to rerun the simulations and obtain the key results. Today's agenda uh, will begin with Farsad Taheripur, professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Purdue University and a GTAP associate. He'll be uh, presenting about the land use in computable general equilibrium models. Uh, it will be followed by uh, Maxime Shepeliev, our very own economist at the Center for Global Tree Analysis. Uh, he will be talking about the GTA Power Database version 10. Uh, the format of these two presentations, uh, so we'll, of the seminar will be, we have 15 minutes for each presenter, followed by 15 minutes of discussion. Uh, I will encourage the audience to please submit your questions via the chat box during the presentation. I will then read them out loud uh, for the presenters to respond in the subsequent 15 minutes of discussion. Uh, so without further ado, I'll give the floor to Farsad, uh, who I know is here. Hi, Farsad, do you want to share your screen? Sure. Should I uh, run the simulate, run the uh, presentation, or you do it? Uh, if you, you can do, do it. That I will do that myself. Okay. So I yeah. know there is a uh, pre-plan for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh... <clears throat> okay. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to present uh, this paper and thank you for all the participants in the webinar. Uh, today I'm presenting a paper that we published in the uh, uh, Journal, of, Journal of Global Economic Analysis, volume number five, uh, uh, num volume five, number two. Uh, this paper is about land use in uh, computational general equilibrium model. My co-authors on this one are uh, Shin Zhao, Mark Horridge, uh, Farid uh, Farrokhi, and uh, Professor Late Wallace E. Tyner. So basically, uh, uh, we were able to uh, work on this paper under the encouragement of uh, Wally uh, and uh, basically uh, the help of Professor uh, Thomas Hertel. As usual, he uh, encouraged us and uh, support uh, on the work, uh, the work on uh, this paper. So, uh, because the paper is already uh, published, I'm going to uh, not go to very details. I'm going to briefly introduce the paper and the main outcomes. So, uh, the paper, as usual, has an abstract introduction, a theoretical background, uh, including discussion on uh, CET approach, 
uh, removing imbalances in physical area of land generated by CET approach, and then land allocation using extreme value distribution functions, uh, land allocation with explicit cost of land conversion, and then uh, we discuss about uh, some uh, numerical analysis of CET based approaches that support uh, finding of the uh, uh, analytical approach presented in uh, section two. Uh, we discussed the simulation results, and then uh, at the end, we made some suggestion and conclusion. We have three appen uh, appendices in this paper. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, basically uh, provides some uh, derivatives related to CET approach, uh, and then appendix B and C are concentrating on uh, using extreme value distribution functions and some uh, very nice simulation done on the uh, numerical analysis of uh, comparing CET and uh, an approach we, I will introduce that to, we call it MCET and uh, frigid uh, stylized models. So <clears throat> in the introduction, uh, we covered the background of modeling land use in CGE. You can see uh, the uh, overview of this practice over time, uh, important papers and important uh, publication in this area. All are cited uh, in this work. Uh, uh, the uh, introduction basically introduces, introduces main approaches in modeling uh, land use in CGE. The most common practices are a CT approach, uh, extreme value distribution functions, other approaches such as land transformation, transformation matrices, uh, cost of land conversion, and simple market clearing conditions. So uh, the main message of this uh, introduction is that CET approach considers heterogeneity in land quality and takes into account implicitly cost of land conversion. It is easy to implement also, but it fails to maintain area of land in balance. So uh, uh, that's the first message of uh, the introduction. And then it discuss uh, uh, various scaling methods that have been used to maintain area of land in balance with CET approach, introduces those approaches. And then uh, it discuss some uh, CG models that use extreme value distribution functions to maintain land in balance. Uh, the uh, theoretical background when it relates to CET, uh, the paper, uh, in this section, the paper analyzes the theory of land allocation in CG models using CET approach and shows why it fails to maintain area of land in balance. The main findings are there is no way to uh, remain on CET frontier and hold the physical land constraint. Uh, it shows that heterogeneity in land prices and curvature of CET land frontier affect the size of imbalance in uh, land area. This section introduces adjustment approaches to maintain area of land in balance. Uh, there are, we divided those into two categories, exposed ex scaling approaches or methods uh, that are post simulation adjustments in land use results to maintain area of land in balance with no welfare implications. Um, and then ex ante scaling approaches that imposes a physical land constraint to maintain area of land in balance during the simulation process with some welfare implications due to shift in uh, CET frontier. Uh, two ex-ante methods are introduced uh, um, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, theoretical background. Uh, we call them uh, MCET and additive CET. Uh, we uh, explain those, how they work and uh, we show that the ACET land supply can be decomposed to a shift factor and a CET land supply. So these are the main uh, um, work on the uh, 
CET in the theoretical background, and then uh, we discuss the uh, properties of uh, threshold distribution function, which is an extreme distribution function, which has been uh, frequently used. We review the most recent papers that used this approach, and then compare this approach with CET and MCET using a set of numerical uh, examples. The most important takeaway messages from this practice are if welfare is of the concern, friendship and CET generate equivalent prediction. If land related parameters such as rent, yield, area of land are the concern, uh, then the CET and friendship approaches uh, provide different outcomes. And like CET, Fretchet approach maintains area of land in balance, but this approach, uh, this approach has two important limitations. It requires equal land rent across users in the benchmark data. And in the calibration process, uh, we must uh, to take into account yield across uses uh, and be uh, explained that the implementation of uh, this requirement in a typical CG model that employs the GTAP database is not trivial. It's not easy to implement that approach. Uh, um, and uh, we um, emphasize that the GTAP database shows heterogeneous land rent across uses, and that is not consistent with the requirement of the uh, uh, Fred approach. So, uh, and, then when we, and then we discuss the land allocation using cost of land conversion. We explain that CT approaches implicit, implicitly takes into account the opportunity cost of land conversion. Uh, two, two categories of uh, opportunity costs. The, the first one is losses in value added in current use when we move to another use. And the second one is the cost of land conversion due to the curvature of the CET function. So uh, the same uh, is related to furniture distribution function. Uh, it does the same, uh, is that, is that is, it does the same. Uh, and then the land transformation elasticity of CET imposes the second type uh, of the opportunity cost. And we show that the larger the size of land, transform land transformation elasticity, the smaller the opportunity cost. And uh, we discussed that a linear CET uh, neglects the second types of opportunity costs. And then we show that uh, CET and Fretchet both ignores the uh, explicit cost of moving land from one type to another type. And uh, we discussed that it is possible to include uh, cost of land transformation uh, explicitly into the CGE model. And we discuss one of those examples uh, with, related to the M with related to the MIT economic projection and policy analysis uh, model, EPPA. So, uh, however, in order to implement this approach, we need uh, side information on the cost of land conversion, which is uh, usually difficult to collect and consider, in particular in a global CGE when you work with a, uh, uh, many areas uh, in your model. So, uh, numerical analysis uh, using a simplified version of GTAP bio model, which represent a one nest CET land allocation. A set of numerical analysis have been made to support the finding of our uh, analytical analysis. All examined simulations targeted an expansion in the US corn ethanol by uh, 747%, about 12.56. Uh, billion gallons, uh, million is wrong, should be billion gallons. Uh, simulations were made with various land transformation elasticities for CET approach. Simulations were made to compare CET, MCET, ACET, and a physical area market clearing condition, which I, uh, with the abbreviation of PAMC. 
I'm going to quickly uh, show some of the results, share some of the results with you. As you can see here, in the first slide of the numerical results, you can see percent imbalances in U.S. land area for three uh, uh, three uh, cases, uh, two CET, which we call it CET1, CET2, CET2, with two values of land transformation elasticity, and a case which represents a market clearing condition. The market clearing condition works uh, using values, uh, value market shares. And as you can see here, uh, the, the numbers are showing the uh, percent deviation from actual area of land in each AEZ. You can see that uh, some of the numbers are positive, some of the numbers are negative. This means that CET sometimes uh, go below the physical area of land, sometimes go above the physical area of land, uh, and the percentage change is uh, um, a couple of uh, could go to a couple of percentages and in particular remember that the shock that we implemented here is not a small shock so uh one thing that you can see uh in this particular picture is that uh the land the size of imbalance is basically um, not changing that much with the size of uh, land transformation elasticity that's the first message important message that we have in the next uh, slide, you can see the size of imbalance and land heterogeneity in land price. Uh, basically, let me back to this uh, slide. You can see that in AEZ-10, we have the largest uh, imbalance. And now that's AEZ-10 in the US. And now when we go to this slide, we have uh, um, uh, dollar per hectare rent for uh, different types of crops and forestry and pasture land, which is used in dairy and ruminant, you can see that the heterogeneity in land price is high. And uh, we've done some simulations to test the sensitivity of uh, imbalance with respect to this heterogeneity in land price. And we see that the heterogeneity in land price is basically driving the uh, uh, size of imbalance. So uh, the next slide that I would like to share with you is the numerical analysis with respect to land allocation for alternative methods. Here you can see uh, the area, uh, initial uh, area, initial data. And then you can see CET1, which is the simulation with the uh, 0.5 land transformation elasticity. And then you can see two approaches, uh, two ex ante approaches, MCET and ACET. Uh, and then you can see the uh, approach with uh, uh, market, physical market clearing condition. Uh, and you can now, in the second panel of this one, you can see the distribution of land across different uses. You can see that, uh, interestingly, uh, CET1, the original CET, and the two approaches, MCET and ACET, they are basically generating the same um, land shares. So the only things that these two uh, approaches are doing, and also the PAMC, the main thing that they do is that they preserve the area of land in balance and maintain the original land allocation of uh, CET across uses. So uh, numerical analysis, again, production and price for alternative methods. You can see, uh, and also supply of uh, different types of crops, forestry, um, um, dairy farm and ruminant. You can see that, uh, of course, uh, in the middle of the first panel, you can see that MCET and ACET are projecting the same percentage change in supply. And on the other panel on the right, you can see that MCET and ACET are again generating the same percentage changes in prices and also, uh, and, and they are both different from the original uh, CET. And uh, let me go to the um, numerical analysis again, welfare impacts of alternative methods. Uh, now here you can see here I highlighted in the first table on the top, you can see uh, welfare impacts of the expansion in uh, ethanol that I, that I mentioned. As you can see in here, uh, uh, 
the results for MCET and ACET are identical. CET one is different, and also PAMC is different from uh, the other two. So uh, basically, uh, one thing which you can see here, sometimes the MCET and ACET generating more welfare and sometimes generating less welfare implication. And that is because these two approaches are making a shift in resources, basically in uh, CET land frontier. And uh, to see how that works in the bottom table, we have a decomposition of welfare impacts, um, which calculated for only uh, the case of US. You can see that uh, um, you have different approaches on each row, and then you can see distribution of welfare across uh, allocation uh, effect, endowment effect, terms of trade, investment saving effect, and the total, you can see that uh, the MCET, which is basically uh, identical to ACET, uh, is generating some endowment effect. And basically that is showing uh, why uh, we have a change in welfare, basically, when we are using the MCET approach. So uh, with that, I can go to, um, you know, the messages of the paper are clear. So uh, just uh, let me, uh, uh, introduce some important related uh, research topics that we think is important to develop uh, uh, from now on. Uh, development of a GTAP-based model in percentage change to use uh, stochastic productivity distribution functions. Uh, that is uh, a, a work that we need to uh, develop to see how we can implement that approach with the GTAP. It's not a trivial task. It needs uh, more effort to do this job. And then uh, what important missing in the literature at this point is that to what extent CT function impose cost of land transformation and how realistic uh, they are. So it's important to know that when we use CET, what types of uh, uh, implicit costs is, is imposed, it, it imposes on the simulation. And if those uh, uh, transformation costs are make sense and uh, they are uh, in line with actual observations. Uh, data on cost of land transformation across uses, that's important uh, items that we think uh, will help to um, uh, model land use changes in future much more better to understand how that works. And, uh, and then uh, we need to find uh, a way which already have, we know how to do it, but we need to uh, explicitly include cost of land transformation in CGE model based on actual data. Uh, and extend that line of research. And uh, another uh, research that we propose is uh, we already have a uh, land use database, uh, which has been generated about uh, 20 years ago, over the past 20 years. Um, the global land use has changed significantly. Uh, we need to uh, provide a uh, fresh, a new uh, database on uh, land use um, that happened over the past 20 years and update that database. And then other important uh, research line that could help to better uh, modeling uh, land use change in CG model is to understand productivity of land in transition. So uh, when we uh, convert forest land or pasture land to crop land, how productivity of those land, uh, uh, what, how much is the productivity of those land in agricultural activities? And then um, the revision of that also is important. If we are going to convert a piece of uh, cropland, uh, how that will uh, generate uh, area of uh, forest and, and uh, those kind of material. These are important uh, lines of uh, research, which we think will improve the uh, modeling of uh, land use change in CG models in future much more better. Thank you for your attention. And I think, I hope that I have not exceeded the, um, I have not exceeded the, um, 
the time. Don't don't, don't you worry for that. I actually, I was waiting for more questions, and since uh, they come up came out late, uh, I gave I, I didn't give you any warnings. But but like as I say, there's they came in late, so we have three questions. Okay. Uh, we can get right to them. How are different land types nested in GitHub Bio? How many nests do you use? So uh, in the actual uh, GTAB, uh, in the actual GTAB uh, bio model, uh, we have a uh, nest which uh, simulate changes in land cover between forest, pasture, and cropland. That is uh, the first nest, uh, let's say at the bottom of the nest of land supply. And then we have uh, the upper nest, which is uh, one nest allocating cropland between different types of crops. In one version of the model, which, which simulate uh, uh, implication of dedicated energy crops, we have an additional nest, which is uh, um, uh, handling the allocation of uh, basically uh, cropland pasture and unused land to uh, uh, the, the competition between traditional crops and uh, uh, dedicated crops. These are the nesting structure that we have in that. Thank you for that. Uh, another question is, could you elaborate on the technical difficulties in implementing the different alternatives to the CET function? So, uh, basically, uh, as I mentioned, uh, if, if you wanted to uh, implement, uh, remove the uh, imbalances in CET, either approaches, uh, ACET and MCET, both of them are good. They are equally, uh, uh, they are very um, equal in terms of uh, generating the same results. However, from one aspect, the uh, MCET, it, it is easier to implement in the GTAB uh, structure because uh, it's, it's CET, just you need to change a variable from endogenous to endogenous. So that's that's basically make the MCET much more easier to implement in the GTAB. Uh, this is a question. The, the uh, point here is that, I'm sorry, just uh, uh -huh. implement. The, the point here is that if you if you are working, for example, with a, uh, um, a GTA bio version, uh, you need just to uh, add a physical land constraint and swap the uh, productivity adjustment uh, with productivity adjustment area with the physical area to handle the case. So it does not need that much of effort in terms of coding and changing them all. Okay, thank you for, for that first that. There's a related question uh, in parentheses. Does anyone have experience implementing the MCT CET function on MPSGE? I don't know if you have, but maybe it's an open question for, for the audience as well who can welcome to chime into the chat box. Uh, Dominique mentions uh, a comment. You should highlight that the ACET is not invariant to calibration, unlike the CET. And uh, there's another question from Erwin, uh, uh, just wondering why the CRET function was not included in the comparison. Um, so uh, the, our understanding is that the CRET function is, uh, and that is uh, a message that we got uh, from uh, basically Tom, uh, and, and the point here is that the correct function is not representing agricultural activities, the idea of be behind agricultural activities well. So for that reason, we have not worked on that. Okay. I think we have a, a few more minutes for any additional comment or question. So, uh, an additional comment that I would like to mention is that uh, uh, when we move from uh, CET approach uh, with exposed uh, adjustments to MCET, which is a ex ante adjustment, uh, we may need to uh, consider um, re-evaluation of land transformation elasticities. 
so uh, that that is an important fact, and uh, we may need to work on that uh, in future. Right, and thank you for that. There's perhaps we can make this the last question. Uh, what is the intuition behind the endowment effect in the welfare decomposition? So, uh, as I mentioned, um, when we move to uh, MCET or ACET, these approaches shift the land frontier, the CET land frontier, up and down to go and match with the physical uh, with the physical area of land. If I have time, I can show you a graph that explains that important point. Do we have, have time for that? Yes, yes, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, the follow-up on this question is, uh, as the total endowment is fixed, right? So I guess you, you're gonna mm -hmm. hit, hit right on to that. So why yeah. don't you go ahead? Yeah, yeah. So let me back to the uh, presentation. Okay, so in this presentation, what you can see, it's a simple picture of what is going on. Um, you have two types of land, X1 and X2. The sum of the two is X, which is the um, a black line that you can see. Uh, that is our uh, land, physical land allocation um, constraint. And then you see the curve, the black curve is showing the CET uh, frontier. Um, point A is the initial equilibrium. And then um, due to a shock with, uh, in the system, your initial equilibrium from A goes to B. In B, you can see that clearly uh, we are on the uh, CET land frontier but we are above the, uh, um, we, we are on the CET land frontier, but we are below the physical land frontier. So in order to go to C, which is on the uh, physical land frontier, you see a shift, you need a shift in that land frontier. And that shift in land frontier basically uh, is the source of the uh, welfare, welfare implication change uh, endowment effect. That's 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 showing the endowment effect. So as I mentioned before, uh, MCET and ACET representing point C, which is basically uh, showing the same land share between X1 and X2. So point C has exactly the same land share between um, 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 comparable with C. The only difference is that it is on the uh, physical land frontier and, and moving from B to C, which means a shift on your uh, uh, productivity adjusted area, which we call it, which we call it CET frontier. That is what's happening and uh, generating uh, that uh, welfare impact. Thank you, Farsad. I think we're just in time for moving to the next presentation. Um, if we, if you can stop sharing your sure. presentation, I will bring Maxim on board. Sure, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for that attention. Hello, Maxim. The floor is yours. Don't forget to unmute yourself. That looks. Hello. That looks. Can looks you good. see my screen? Good. Yeah. Thank you, Ankel, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. So in this presentation, um, I'll briefly discuss the paper that was published uh, um, in the same issues, uh, paper that Farzad has just presented in the Journal of Global Economic Analysis. And uh, this is a paper about the most recent GDA Power Database, version 10. So in terms of the outline of the presentation, I'll first briefly introduce the motivation behind the updates of the uh, GTA powers that were introduced in, um, in this paper. Uh, then I'll discuss some key features of the constructed database, uh, provide an illustrative application by tracking carbon intensities of power generation technologies. And then in the last two sections, I'll first briefly summarize uh, 
what was done and uh, we'll discuss some next steps. And then also one summary slide on overviewing some other GitHub environmental extensions on um, that is an ongoing work in, in the center. So in terms of the uh, motivation for the uh, GitHub power in general, the explicit representation of various generation technologies in the CG framework is a very important feature if someone wants to model an environmental policies, uh, climate mitigation policies, uh, because you want to observe what is the change in the uh, generation mix while the standard GitHub database reports a single electricity uh, and heat generation sector. So essentially it does not allow for, for this more uh, detailed uh, analysis. So because of this um, relevant question, high demand for this um, kind of uh, database since GTAP 9, a uh, specific version of the GTAP database called GTAP Power was developed. It was first developed by Jeff Peters uh, and is also published in the Journal for Global Economic Analysis in 2016 uh, paper. So the database has disaggregated the electricity sector into 11 generation technologies plus transmission and distribution. Um, the database has been widely used in, in the uh, integrated assessment modeling community, in the TGE community. There is a special version of the GTAP model called GTAP Power that uh, uses this database. A lot of other dynamic global uh, economic models also rely on this database. Uh, but in, in this update, we try to address some limitations that were identified in their um, initial uh, GTAP Power 9 database and, and to provide corresponding improvements. Um, so on this, on this slide, you can see uh, the three specific limitations and improvements that we're introducing. And uh, I'll now discuss them briefly. And then on the next slide, we'll uh, have a closer look into them and the way we address them and how this impacts their database uh, construction process and, and the resulting database. Um, so first, is that in, in the initial GTA Power database to, to provide a split of different generation technologies, uh, electricity generation volumes were used on the electricity generation volume. So heat generation volumes were not included. Uh, at the same time, in the GTA, uh, in the standard GTA database, electricity sector includes both heat and electricity generation. So the fact of applying only electricity generation volumes uh, has led to some not always consistent and appropriate re representation of the energy generation mix, especially in, in the countries that have high, high volumes of heat generation, uh, like many Eastern European countries, Northern uh, European countries, where uh, share of uh, heat can, can even exceed the share of electricity generated uh, within, within the aggregate sector. Um, so in, in this update, we, we address this limitation. Uh, second, um, when splitting transmission and distribution activity uh, from the aggregate electricity activity in the previous version of GTA Power, a single transmission and distribution share was used uh, based on their uh, US data, 22% of the total cost structure. Um, of course, in reality, this is not the case because uh, market electricity market structure varies a lot by countries. Uh, electricity grid is very different. Uh, pricing approach is also different. Uh, so not only uh, transmission and distribution shares vary by countries, they also vary by years, depending on different uh, underlying factors. Uh, so in this update, we collect data on uh, transmission distribution shares for 80 countries of the world. And, and we, uh, these data also year specific were appropriate and we implement this to the uh, database. Finally, um, we also take into account uh, these um, updates uh, for the levelized cost of electricity generation in the sense that we now include both heat and electricity uh, levelized cost of, of generation. And we also, uh, make levelized cost of electricity generation year specific, relying on, on uh, data sources in the sense that now uh, in the database, we can observe that, for instance, for some renewable generation technologies like wind and solar, where there has been a significant improvement in, in terms of reducing the cost of, of the uh, electricity generation. Now this can be observed in the database if, if 
uh, for instance, two reference years like 2011 and 2014, 2007 and 2014 are compared. Um, so getting back to the first point of uh, heat uh, generation and then code generation in their uh, database. So on, on the left side of the screen, um, uh, blue bars, they show the share of heat generation in total electricity and heat generation by countries. So you can see that in some countries, especially Eastern European, Central European countries like Lithuania, uh, Belarus, and, and even a uh, country like uh, Russian Federation, which, which is one of the biggest um, energy uh, producers in the world, the share of heat generation is exceeding 50%, meaning that uh, it's more heat is generated in energy uh, terms uh, than, than electricity. Um, while uh, average global average share is, is around 13%. So why uh, this can be an issue if on the electricity volumes are used when providing the split of the electricity and heat generation. Uh, and that's the issue is that the heat is generated by a limited set of technologies. In particular, over half of heat is generated by gas-based generation. Um, and the remaining with coal, oil, uh, other base load like bio-based generation. So if on the electricity shares are applied, uh, mm, mm, this would lead to the mis misrepresentation of technology. So essentially the share of uh, gas generation would be lower than in reality, and the share of other generation technologies like nuclear, so, uh, renewable generation would be higher than in reality. So uh, mm, compared to what is actually reported in the energy balances. Moving to the second point of the transmission distribution costs. Uh, so this map shows uh, how transmission distribution costs differ by countries. Uh, so as I mentioned, we have collected data for 80 countries covering a lot of uh, African countries, also European countries, uh, some large energy consumers and producers like Russia, China, US, Brazil. Um, and transmission distribution shares vary dramatically by countries. So from 4% in, in Seychelles to 56% in uh, Lesotho, with a global average of around 25%. But even within Europe, for instance, uh, we can observe that shares varying from around 11% in Bulgaria to over 50% in Slovakia. So uh, definitely a very different setup of electricity markets, um, grid system, uh, density of population, all, all impacts their uh, transmission distribution share. So we have implemented this uh, country and year specific in some cases, especially for EU uh, year specific data is available, uh, transmission distribution shares to the database. So, and, and before uh, implementing these updates to the GTAP Power 10 database, uh, we made a comparison for the GTAP Power 9 database uh, with updated data inputs and with initial data inputs, uh, just to be able to see what, what are the impacts of these updates and whether they uh, show what we would expect. So, uh, so first, uh, what, what you can see here is uh, uh, global electricity and heat generation uh, shares by different technologies. And what you can see here, for the case of gas base load generation, um, this is actually the, the main um, electricity generation type that was impacted by this updated uh, um, treatment of heat and electricity generation volume. So we can see that uh, the share of gas base load has increased by, um, by almost uh, 30% or 5 percentage points from around uh, 15% to over 19%. Um, the second most impacted um, generation time is, is oil, oil peak page generation, increasing from 3 to 4.6%. But then all other generation uh, types, and that's what one would expect because they are not uh, generating heat or a lot of heat, for instance, like hydro based load or um, solar uh, power or wind power, they, they have decreased their shares. Also, like nuclear based load, for instance, which, which does not generate heat. So now we have a more representative uh, treatment of uh, generation mix, including both heat and electricity generation. So 
But when we look into specific countries that were impacted the most by these changes, we can see even even more, um, even much higher differences. So, for instance, um, looking into two uh, um, generations that have impacted the most, have been impacted the most in terms of down, uh, in terms of upward change, gas-based load and oil peak load, and two generations that have been impacted the most in terms of downward change, nuclear generation and hydro generation. So for hydro, we combine both peak and base uh, for this comparison. We can see that in, in many countries, for instance, gas-based load generation uh, has increased by 20 percentage points and more, like in the case of Ukraine, over 30 percentage points. And then at the same time, looking into where there was a reduction in the case of Ukraine, for instance, that was the nuclear generation, because essentially nuclear power in Ukraine is like the um, over 50% of total generation. So it was significantly overrepresented due to the fact that heat generation was not taken into account. But but now uh, taking into account the heat generation, we have a more, uh, more appropriate mix. Um, among some other in most impacted countries, uh, Eastern and Northern Europe, like Latvia, also Estonia, Denmark, um, Slovakia, Romania, increasing gas-based load generation where like the share of heat is high, um, and then reducing nuclear and hydro generation also in uh, same in Latvia, former Soviet Union countries, um, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Sweden. So. A lot of action going on in, in particular northern Eastern Europe. Um, but also, for instance, France, where the, there is like some district heating, especially like in Paris, for instance. Uh, so the share of nuclear is, is also falling. So in, in, in terms of applications and just to showcase how the GTA Power database can be used apart from CG based modeling applications, which uh, uh, there are many of these. Uh, we have tracked uh, carbon intensity of uh, final consumption of electricity by different generation technologies. Um, so we uh, we compared the direct emissions. So if you just estimate how much uh, how much coal based load uh, produces CO two emissions, and then uh, divided by uh, and then divide the um, value of this uh, electricity generation by the emissions, uh, you get how much kilogram of CO2 per kilowatt hour uh, are the direct uh, emissions produced by the uh, specific generation technology. But then we have also compared the life cycle emissions uh, and emissions through the entire value chain. So if you take into account how much, for instance, emissions were uh, generated uh, through the production of steel that was then used to build their coal power plant, how much uh, emissions of uh, were generated uh, through their petroleum products and were then used for the transportation purposes uh, for, for instance, transporting coal to the coal power plant. So we take all these uh, emissions into account and estimate the entire life cycle emissions. So of course, these life cycle emissions they would be higher than the direct emissions because they now include this extra all all, all the emissions through the entire value chain, um, and we compare this by different generation technologies. So of course, not surprisingly, like coal based uh, is is the dirtiest technologies, and and then we see that um, all the renewables and as well as nuclear, if we take direct emissions only into account, they they are emission free, but. But if we take into account the whole life cycle emissions, then uh, they are producing somewhere between 10 and 30 grams uh, of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Um, on average, the, when, when we compare com, um, comparing life cycle emissions with direct emissions, so um, when you take into account all, all uh, value chain emissions, on, on average, an increase in uh, carbon intensity is between 10 and 20 percent. So. Uh, for instance, like in the case of uh, gas, gas peak load emissions increase from uh, 460 grams to 540 grams. These are global averages, so so around uh, 20%. Um, and then we can also do some comparison of, of uh, life cycle emissions of their um, renewable generation technologies, which, are, which do not have any direct emissions, but then, for instance, we can say that 
some hydro based load uh, turns to be the cleanest technology uh, compared to, for instance, wind or, or solar power generation. Of course, when we look by, by countries, we also can, can observe the deviations um, in indirect in, in the life cycle emissions. Uh, this is a map that illustrates carbon intensity of coal power generation. Uh, and so this takes into account not only differences in the technology of coal power generation, but also differences in the uh, value chain emissions. And and what can, what can see what we can see here is that the, of course coal power based generation emissions vary per per kilowatt hour quite significantly by over four times by country. So from uh, four hundred grams to around one point seven kilograms per kilowatt hour. Um, and and even in 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 case while in most cases advanced economies like developed economies in Western Europe they have lower emission levels uh, emission intensities it's not always the case so for instance China has an average lower uh, this full cycle uh, coal power based uh, generation emission intensities than for instance Australia or China or Canada. Um, so in this sense, we can we can provide a more um, kind of broad and complete comparison of the life cycle emission uh, intensities for specific generation technologies. Um, and with this, we, we then, for instance, can compare um, how much emissions based on the specific generation mix are produced, for instance, by electric vehicles in, in each country and compare those, for instance, with uh, hybrid vehicles or petroleum based uh, conventional vehicles and show in some cases that with if the country has a dirty electricity mix, then switching to their electric vehicles can be even more damaging to the environment than, for instance, using hybrid vehicles or conventional um, fossil fuel vehicles with uh, relatively um, high efficiency. Um, so um, to sum up and, and also to outline some next steps. Um, so in, in this uh, update of the GITA power, we have addressed several limitations uh, identified in the previous version. So we have utilized both heat and electricity generation volumes to introduce data splits. And, and this has impacted significantly the generation mix, uh, both globally, but even more significantly in some selected countries. Uh, we have also implemented country and year specific shares of transmission and distribution. So now the cost structure of, of the electricity uh, is also represented much more appropriately compared to, to the previous version. And we also introduced updates to the levelized cost of electricity generation, taking into account both uh, heat and electricity generation mix, but also changes of uh, LCOE over time. Uh, so making them year specific. In terms of potential improvements that uh, we also looking into and that might benefit the database in the future is uh, splitting the electricity and heat generation separately in, in the GTAP uh, database uh, because we have mixed electricity and heat generation and we can't distinguish uh, these volumes of electricity and heat generation apart from doing it on, on site or for instance post simulation. So having them separated might bring us more detail and, and would also ease their implementation of um, sectoral splits uh, to the database. Uh, we also do not have any future alternative technologies represented in the database like uh, CCS, Boston Coal, bio-based CCS or hydrogen. And this is very important for the, some long-term uh, policy assessment because to go to the um, uh, net zero emissions, of course, we need these technologies to be present in the database and, and in the model. So this is another uh, improvement. Uh, finally, introducing some additional technology called details on the energy use side, for instance, like electric vehicles in the transportation would also significantly help for, for the modeling purposes. Because now, for instance, uh, in the GTA power database, in the standard GTA database, we, uh, we have only uh, Transportation, single transportation, uh, well, not single, we have separate transportation activities, but those are all based on, on petroleum based generation, uh, petroleum uh, products use. So we do not have an explicit split of electric vehicles and of course any decarbonization in the transportation sector without having electric vehicles is, is very problematic to be modeled in, uh, in the CG framework. Um, 
And so finally, to, um, to close this presentation, um, I would like to briefly uh, discuss some ongoing work on other GTOP environmental extensions that are uh, in, in many cases linked to the GTOP power. Um, so first, and this is work that uh, we are doing in collaboration with uh, Farzad Haripur, who presented the previous paper, is merging of the GTOP power and GTOP bio databases. So this is currently under development. Uh, so this would allow to, to merge their both ex, uh, detailed representation of the electricity sector, but also uh, uh, bio-based uh, biofuels uh, representation in the GTAP database. Um, there is also an ongoing work on the improvement on GTAP non-CO2 greenhouse gas emission accounts and their pollutant um, emissions. So both non-CO2 and air pollutant are already available to the GTAP users. There is an ongoing work on linking these uh, accounts to the GTAP uh, models like GTAP E and GTAP Power. Um, we are also currently working on uh, with Dominic van der Broek on the non-CO2 uh, mark curves estimates, and also uh, so that we can estimate the abatement costs um, of the non-CO2 greenhouse gases and um, introduce corresponding prices incentives uh, in the modeling framework. Um, we are also currently incorporating non-CO2 uh, in the to the non-CO2 database. We are incorporating industrial CO2 emissions, which is uh, also uh, an important uh, emission accounting that has been missing in in all previous versions of the GTAP database. And this is also very uh, valid for instance for assessing the border carbon adjustment mechanism impacts because a lot of industrial commodities like cement, lime, uh, fertilizers, they are very carbon intensive, but those emissions are not from fossil fuel combustion, but from their, uh, this is industrial emission. Yeah. Um, Finally, we're also developing the GTAP circular economy database, uh, splitting selected GTAP sectors like metals, plastics into primary and secondary parts, uh, also splitting extraction sector and recycling activities. And, and all this data work is also going in parallel with GTAP model extensions that would allow to benefit from, from these data improvements. Uh, so, um, GTAP version 7e and power, and then merging this also to the recursive dynamic version of the uh, GTAP model, GTAP e uh, MRIO version, and, and a lot of other extensions. Um, there are numerous other updates going on, like on the GTAP land use, GTAP nutritional database, and that's something I, I won't touch base on in this presentation. And um, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Maxim. Uh, we have one question so far, um, and this is why I also let you go over the time, uh, but it uh, was very interesting and a good summary of the recent work. And whoa, now Math Matthias has, has come with a lot of uh, information on Matthias. Anyway, let's start with the first one. Uh, could you talk a bit more about how shares for transmission and distribution are developed for the U.S.? Yeah, so uh, these are based on the uh, cost structure of the um, electricity pricing. So the share of uh, transmission and distribution costs in the total uh, um, price of the of the electricity. And these are also distinguished by uh, private users and and uh, and other users. So this is the source of their information. And and specific information sources can be found in the papers referenced. All right, thank you, Maxine. There's two questions uh, from Matthias, as I mentioned, regarding the life cycle emission. First, emissions related to capital are not included, and that's kind of like a verification for you. Uh, and most bottom up life cycle calculations include, for example, the emissions to produce windmills, solar panels, etc. This would need to be included in your calculation. So, a little bit about if you can talk about that, uh, I'll let you answer. Before yeah, so for this specific illustrative application, we used CO2 emissions only. So it, it did not include any non-CO2 emissions. It did not include air pollutants or industrial-based CO2 emissions. So this included CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion only. Um, so an emission linked to the capital production. So for instance, if, if, if this is emissions linked to the 
production of iron and steel or any other metals that are then later used as a for the accumulation of the capital, then these emissions would be taken into account. Um, in the non CO2 database, we also have emissions linked to their um, livestock capital, like cattle, for instance, and, and, and other. So this would be taken into account in their non CO2 database. Um, so this is on the, on the capital side. And in terms of the second question, can, can you please uh, repeat the second question? Uh, so most bottom-up life cycle calculations include, uh, for example, the emissions produced uh, of wind windmills, solar panels, and these would not be included in the calculation. But I, I think you've addressed it. So yeah, on, on the second point, uh, if if there, for the production of the solar panel, uh, some emissions were generated, this would be included in, into their life cycle assessment. So this essentially scopes for emissions, yeah, in, in terms of their definition. But again, as I mentioned, for this illustrative application, we did not include uh, non-CO2 emissions or industrial emissions. Right, so the second part, it's a little bit longer, so let, let's go a little bit by bit. If you compare emissions per kilowatt, right, it's an average of electricity and heat, so in your example, uh, to calculate the carbon footprint for EVs could be problematic as the emission per kilowatt metric typically declines with a higher share of heat. But you can only use electricity to power an electric vehicle. Therefore, splitting heat and electricity would be helpful for a cleaner comparison, but will introduce other challenges, for example, joint heat and electricity generation. So it's more, I guess it's a bit more of a comment. Yeah, so um, just a brief reaction. It, it's correct that it's a mix of uh, heat and electricity. Um, but then, so first we can focus on some countries where the share of heat is very small, so this wouldn't have uh, much of an impact. At the same time, we want to avoid the cogeneration point. Yeah, so for instance, in, in Ukraine or Russia, cogeneration would take place anyway, so this indeed would be uh, a challenge. Thank you very much, Maxim. We have uh, a few more minutes. Um, Matthias, thanks you. And, uh, uh, and Angel, if I could just yes. follow up on, on the last point. Um, of course. The, the new GTAB model, of course, allows for joint production. So from a, from a modeling point of view, uh, the challenge isn't all that great. You would need elasticity um, for the joint production um, CET function, uh, but there, there might, in the in the specific case of heat and electricity, those those elasticities may actually be be available for for some of these countries where heat cogeneration is, is a large part of um, of that sector. Yes, thank you, Dominique. Um, another question that just entered, just to clarify, the source for the life cycle emissions are emissions data from GTAP database itself. Um, any other source that you have been using? Uh, so again, for this illustrative application, it was just CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion from GTAP. Uh, but we also have some other ongoing work where we complement this data with uh, non-CO2 accounts. Those are mostly sourced from EDGAR and also from the FAO uh, emissions database. And also with their pollution accounts, which are also uh, mostly sourced from EDGAR database and complemented with, with some other uh, um, data sources. And in addition, industrial CO2 emissions, so essentially uh, closing their um, cycle of, of emission accounting. So the only kind of missing, well, not missing, it is reported in the non-CO2 database, but not uh, but not mapped to any specific uh, activity as a land use emissions. So we, we report them in aggregate land use emissions, but we do not redistribute them between selected sectors or, or activities because there is not enough information to do that, so we uh, rely on users to, to treat these emissions in, in the most appropriate way for their application. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you, Maxime. Uh, is there any other question? We have time for one more, perhaps. Well, if not, I'd like to thank you both uh, presenters for a very enjoyable uh, presentations. I think I've learned a lot of new things, and I'm glad that you guys share also Maxim on the prospective work that we're coming <laughs> coming soon uh, to everyone. Uh, I'm just going to wrap up very quickly to mention that here in the bottom you have the link where these uh, G2UP virtual seminars are being recorded and available to you as a conveniently as a YouTube video. So thank you all for your participation and we'll see you hopefully soon in live. Thank you.